Um, I'm William Moffat, and Sir Philip Rogers and I are members of Radcliffe Chambers, and we're going to be talking to you about contentious probate, catching up the fraudsters. We deny being the fraudsters, um, but to merely the presenters of the talk. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're here by default because you, the, uh, we follow on from the main talk, then you're still welcome. Um, the origin of our subject uh, was really a, a discussion between Sophia and I about two perceptions that there are in um, contentious probate that we're aware of. As I was saying, the, the origin of this uh, session is a perception that we, we're aware of um, among practitioners that it's as challenging as ever to establish a case in um, uh, fraudulent calumny or undue influence. Um, but that by contrast, there seem to be more success in recent cases in establishing uh, forgery. Um, now, it's very difficult, obviously, to test whether those trends uh, are accurate, I mean, empirically. Um, but if you do look at um, cases in which undue influence and fraudulent calumny have failed, it does look rather like a, a graveyard of uh, attempts, no doubt in each case where the claimants were confident that the will in question was not the voice of the testator. Um, and so in, in recent years, there are, there are a number of cases of, of, of failures uh, in, in, in both cases. And we wondered what the, the source of this trend might be, if it's, if it's a real one. Um, it's not readily explicable from the burden of proof. I mean, we start from the position that it's the ordinary civil burden of proof in undue influence in fraud and in forgery, uh, that you're looking to establish uh, the case on the, on the balance of probabilities. Um, but then perhaps there are explanations as to why undue influence and fraudulent calumny are difficult to establish. Because as we know, you're looking, the, the, the more serious the allegation, the more cogent the evidence that you need to establish it. We know that from reage. Um, and of course, there's the nature of undue influence, which of course is that it happens usually behind closed doors, unknown to the uh, party who is seeking to set aside uh, the, uh, the will said to be vitiated. Um, it is possible in theory to infer undue influence from a set of circumstances, but we know that the bar is set very high as, as Mr. Justice Lewis as he then was in re Edwards told us, it's not enough to prove that the facts are consistent with the hypothesis of undue influence, what must be shown is that the facts are inconsistent with any other hypothesis. Um, I pause there to observe that that could be said to be inconsistent with the uh, civil standard of uh, civil standard of proof on the balance of probabilities. Uh, this idea that it's the only other explanation, uh, the only explanation available for a particular will is it was procured by undue influence. It would seem to limit the inference of undue influence to a very rare um, scope of circumstances. Um, such as a stranger procuring a will entirely in their favour. Um, but for any will in favour of a family man, as they often are, would have the explanation of natural love and affection. And indeed, a will in favour of a carer might also have um, the uh, motive of gratitude for the care that they've been given. So, so to show that it's inconsistent with any other hypothesis is to set the bar very high. Um, the answer to many practitioners is to plead undue influence in those circumstances uh, as a want of knowledge and approval, um, so as to put the burden on the party for handing the will um, by raising suspicious circumstances. Um, but but we, are, um, we are told in cases such as Ark uh, that the court will not allow um, the knowledge and approval route to be a, a screen by which you allege fraud. Again, that seems to me a very difficult line to draw. Um, in my experience, I can only think of one case in which um, a party's claim has been, a knowledge and approval has been struck out where the allegations made really amounted to fraud. Um, I sense in that case that the, the judge was really frustrated with that party for, for other reasons. Um, but there's going to be, a, a, you would think, a broad overlap between the sorts of uh, conduct uh, that would amount to exciting suspicion and those which would amount to, um, to fraud and dishonesty in practice. Um, so looking, coming back to our perceived trend in, in greater success in forgery cases, but a falling success in forgery calumny and undue influence cases, it's not really explicable by the burden. In theory, the burden of proof should be harder still in forgery um, because you're faced with a will that is, uh, bears the signature of witnesses. So you're potentially having to prove the dishonesty of, of not one person, the forger, but three people, uh, the forger, 
uh, and the two witnesses um, who have, uh, and you're also facing the presumption of due execution if there's an attestation clause as you'd expect in, in the will. But, but and it seems to me that there may be some uh, explanation uh, of the, the burden of proof, uh, some explanation offered by the burden of proof in cases, because what you do have in forgery cases is something tangible. So unlike cases in which you're trying to infer undue influence from matters that you, you haven't seen, in a forgery case, you do have the product of the fraud. You've got the will itself, the, the purported will. Um, and that's obviously important because it can be subjected to uh, forensic analysis and expert analysis. But more than that, it pins the uh, alleged forger down in, in place and time because uh, the rule will have a particular date. Uh, and will be said to remain in particular circumstances. Uh, and that, of course, gives you the opportunity to start to forensically analyze the case and to see whether that fits uh, with the known context. And you have a further assistant, potentially, but there's a recent willingness in the cases that we're going to look at shortly in forgery for the courts to place the burden of proof not on the party alleging forgery, but on the party propounding the will. Um, and, and whilst that might not be determinative in many cases, it perhaps um, reveals a, a change in approach uh, that will put uh, the alleged forger on the back foot um, by having to positively uh, set out a case and establish a case uh, and, and reveal perhaps more than they would want to. Um, we're gonna focus on the forgery cases to see what, what is in them that has led to their success. Uh, and it's going to be something of a whistle stop tour in the time that we have. Um, and those are the cases we will, we will look at. I should say um, these are cases in which forgery has been successfully established. Rebrunt re is, is due for retrial. Uh, the appeal was allowed on the basis that the um, failure of the claim in the first instance was um, unjustified. Um, so, Sophia, will you start us off with Patel and Patel? Oh, um, well, so yeah, as um, Will has just said, um, our plan is to do a whistle stop tour through these cases. So I'm not going to do a really thorough analysis of Patel, um, but basically I try to look at how it was that this fraudster got caught out. Um, what you need to know, well, the case summary is that there was a very wealthy family, substantial worldwide interests, mum died leaving four sons who were all in a long running acrimonious dispute across multiple jurisdictions. Um, and within that, three of the brothers were alleging that Giresh, the other brother, had been forging documents. So it was already a case of people alleging forgery against one another. Um, the previous will, 1986, left everything to one son, who was the defendant in the probate claim. And Giresh brought his claim to prove a later, 2005, which he was the defendant um, said that he thought that Giresh had forged the will. I don't know whether I've got control to change slides. Will, would you mind? Thanks. Um, so what did Fordster say? Oh, sorry. What did Fordster say in this case? Um, well, he says, I didn't know about any earlier will. Mum asked me to make this will for her. I didn't think it was necessary, but um, I drafted it for her myself, homemade in English, notwithstanding the fact that that wasn't the language she spoke. Um, my secretary typed it up. Execution took place in my London offices. Um, he said the people present for execution included mum himself and then people connected to him, three ladies, um, a former employee, um, his brother-in-law's wife, um, and mother English um, and then he just said I conveniently forgot about this will until three years after mum's death and I never told my brothers about it so oh gone too far court held forgery and on what basis so key part of the evidence the judge seems to have looked at was just a finding that his explanation for things wasn't very plausible um, he his story that he forgot about the will just until it conveniently um, became useful to him in the other litigation with his brothers. The court just said, we think your explanation of that's implausible. I think he said he'd been on some medication at the time 
but I think one in a thousand or one in 100 people would get a symptom of memory impairment. <laughs> Um, so the judge just said, I don't find that very convincing. Um, it was also found that the paper that the will was printed on was cut down old company headed paper. Um, and there was evidence that the mother used to pre-sign these letter headed letters and then text would be fitted around it. And the court said, so it's very odd anyway to have used down, cut, cut, used cut down old company headed paper. The fact they didn't see a solicitor and the delay in disclosing the will was all suspicious. Further, there is a documentary record. So in the previous or other litigation, Giresh had been making inconsistent statements saying that mum never told me in 25 years that she'd made a will, which was obviously inconsistent with him now saying that not only had she made one, but he was the one that prepared it for her and was at the execution. The most interesting part of this case, and it's probably my favourite forgery case, is the judgment reads very much like an American courtroom drama. Um, the witnesses just crumbled under cross-examination, which we all know is not very um, usual. Usually witnesses tend to stick doggedly to their story, even when it's not actually very useful to them to do so. Um, in this case, the counsel, I think, for the defendant had been very clear and got directions from the judge that each of the witnesses were to be kept separate. They were not to liaise, to practice their evidence, they were meant to be called to give evidence one at a time in court and the others not be present so they couldn't hear what the other person had said before they had their turn. Um, and during the course of cross-examination, it was put to each of them um, that they had met up. Questions were asked, have you all attended so-and-so's house on X night to practice your evidence? And they all said no. And then finally, one of the ladies cracked and she said, well, actually, yes, I was lying. And then the judge recalled all of the witnesses again and they all confirmed they had been lying. Um, so the court said I can't attach any weight to their evidence. Further, the court said that there was nothing outside the witness evidence to independently then corroborate Giresh's case. Um, and the court paid particular attention, it seems, to the failure by the forger to take advantage of opportunities to prove his case. Um, so, for example, the metadata from the PC that was used to type the will would presumably have been able to prove when it was created. Um, but Goresh said, oh, I can't produce that. And he alleged that the PC had been stolen before the proceedings commenced. And next slide. Um, other factors were that Goresh had a strong motive um, to forge the will. And I think this is something in the case of Brunt that I'm involved in on appeal, the um, the appeal judge said, you have to remember that a probate forgery claim is effectively a fraud trial. So the court will look at things like motive to determine whether something's a forgery or not, um, or at least take it into account. He was in a position, it was also found that Goresh was in a position to exercise influence over the other witnesses. He had means to commit the forgery um, by way of these pre-signed papers by mum and the expert evidence strongly supported that it was a forgery. For example, there are impression signatures on the document to show that mum had signed various papers one on top of another, consistent with the idea that they were pre-signed documents and chemical anal analysis showed that the date of mum's signature on the will predated the witness's signatures. So overall, it was a strong case with various different types of evidence that the court could rely on. Um, another very interesting outcome from Patel that I think will be useful to remind witnesses to wills of in future um, is contempt of court applications can arise. In Patel, it was a successful contempt application against Goresh and all three ladies. They were all found in contempt and I think conceded that at the final hearing. Goresh got a 12 month prison sentence, not suspended. And then the witnesses got three months suspended sentence. So there's some quite serious fallout, isn't there, from um, from giving false evidence in support of a forgery allegation, even if you're not um, the forger yourself. So that's Patel. Thanks a bit. Yes, you'd think the strong disincentive to witnesses who are um, uh, considering lying to the court about, about their attendance, the signature of a will that isn't uh, genuine. Uh, a quick look now at Cook and Ab Abrams, which is from 2018. It was a, a decision of the deputy master um, it was a case in which the alleged forger was in, forgers were in, were in person. They, they didn't rely on any expert evidence to, to support uh, their case that the will that they relied upon was genuine. The claimant was represented and did have an expert report. Um, it was all about the estate of the late Mrs Edwards, who uh, had a home in the UK, um, about which the, 
and just people really focused on the asset in question, but she died in Zimbabwe in 2015. It was a case in which the original will was never available, um, but that uh, did not prevent the expert evidence having, uh, having some weight because uh, there were comparison signatures. And of course, an expert can, can look at the style of signature, whether it's consistent with known uh, instances of the deceased's handwriting. Yeah. That is their powerful signature and a hospital card, a very genuine signature. The, um, the propounder of the will was the, the deceased's nephew, the second descendant. Um, and uh, he, his case was, well, she treated me like a son. I was the closest person to her life. That's why I've got a will that favours me. Uh, and he relied on this will of, of November 2011 with him as the major beneficiary. He said, if there are any variations in her signature, well, that's just natural. Um, she did. She signed her signature in different ways. Um, in his explanation of where the original had gone, he said, well, I lost it when I entrusted it to a friend who wasn't very reliable. And I've not heard from him since, uh, broadly speaking. Um, and there was obviously, a, cumulatively, there was a sense that the, that the story wasn't ringing true. Um, what uh, the litigants in person, the defendants, what they, they majored on was that the, uh, the claimants in seeking expert evidence about photocopy had initially be, um, approached an expert who had declined to give an opinion uh, because he said he would like to see the original. So the defendants said, well, it's not primitive. You, you can't rely on a photocopy. Um, and therefore, I, I apply to have your expert evidence excluded on that basis, uh, which was refused. Um, and you can see that it might be a, uh, a ruse of the forger uh, to only produce a photocopy, the belief that you are, by one remove, cloaking it uh, from proper analysis. Um, and uh, therefore, um, possibly foil attempts to analyse it. So we can't prove it's a forger because I've only got a photocopy. Uh, didn't work. And they also said, well, I've already got probate in this will in Zimbabwe. So I rely on, I rely on that. It's uh, already raised you to pass, it said the defendants. Um, the circumstances in which he said it had been found were that um, his niece, the, the, the second defendant's niece, had denied it and said, oh my God, I found the will. Um, exclamation mark. Um, the court held it was a forgery. Um, and there's an interesting passage on the burden of proof that the deputy master held that the burden of proof was on the party propounding the will, i.e. the alleged forger, to prove that it wasn't a forgery. And the way the deputy master, master approached that was to say, well, it's like knowledge and approval. There's, there's grounds to excite the suspicion of the court. Um, and you have to prove that the, um, this was the act of the volition and, and awareness of the testator. Um, so the burden is on, is on, on you, the defendants. Um, another key factor, very important was Mr. Bradley's uh, expert uh, report. He said there was strong evidence of forgery, notwithstanding there was, was only a photocopy in front of him, but that there were variations in the style of, of signature. Uh, and the court held that um, there was no determination in Zimbabwe about the uh, validity of the will, merely a grant of probate or the equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. um, what really swung it, other than the expert evidence, was just the sheer number of um, members of the family, an uncle, a sister, a sister in law niece, that the claimant was able to call in evidence to say that this purported will was entirely contrary to all that they knew of the deceased and her wishes. Uh, and in fact, the deceased was, was known to have distrusted the second defendant, who she regarded as lazy, mean and greedy. Selfish and greedy, and he can't have a single cent of mine, which she was, she was said to have said. So, um, uh, the, it, it didn't accord with what was known of her. Um, also, that she never mentioned this alleged will to anyone else. So she didn't mention to any of those that, uh, to those that were close to her. She didn't mention it to a lawyer in Zimbabwe about a year or so after the alleged will, when she came to make a new will and was asked whether you have any wills, former wills to revoke, and said no. Um, and it's a case. It's a diary case as well. We, there were very full diaries. She was a meticulous diary keeper. And there was no nothing, no entries uh, consistent with having made a will. And the, the entries were inconsistent with having made a will in 2011, as the defendants alleged. And last but not least, uh, this homemade will uh, that was relied upon was 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 typed um, by all accounts. The deceased always wrote by hand. Didn't have access to a computer. Didn't own a computer. Didn't have a typewriter. Um, and there was no explanation as to how she would have produced this document. So if you're going to forge a document, make sure it's consistent with um, the deceased's. 
uh, behavior. And of course, if she really writes things in hand, your task is all the greater because you'd have to uh, mimic her handwriting over an entire document. Um, well, next up is Ball, Reball deceased. Um, and this is the case summary, this is what you need to know about it. Mum, in this case, died leaving two children, David and Linda. The background, um, I think a theme running through this is that the background is often very important about what the relationships are um, and what's been going on prior to this apparent will being executed. Um, in this case, mum's husband had died in 2012 and she'd been struggling to cope. Daughter Linda had been managing her finances until about August 2015, where a dispute developed because allegations were made that she'd been stealing mum's money. As a result, mum made a 2015 professionally drawn will, appointing son as sole executor, majority beneficiary, and then rest of residue to grandchildren. After death, Linda produced homemade 2017 will, appointing her and her husband as executors, splitting the majority of residue between her and David, and then rest to grandchildren. So David brought the probate claim challenging the validity of the 2017 will on grounds of forgery and knowledge and approval. So what did Linda say? Well, the crucial point about what Linda said was she was quite specific on date and timings of things, which got her into trouble. So she said that mum had asked me to make the will for her watched it myself she says that specifically at 2 p.m or around 2 p.m on the 4th of january 2017 i collected mum from her bungalow drove her to my house and we executed the will and mr and mrs binks witnessed it but it was a very brief encounter court held forgery um, and what was the evidence or key factors relevant to forgery in this case well there was cctv I'm sure that Linda hadn't realised that CCTV had been installed outside Mum's bungalow by brother after the dispute over the money, um, but it had been, and the CCTV was active on the 4th of January and it showed that Mum didn't leave the house at all. It also showed that Linda never came to the bungalow to collect her. It did show that other people had been in and out of the bungalow though. Um, so she just couldn't be two places at once. It just the, court, the judge just said this is really strong evidence that this is all just a fabrication. This incident just didn't happen. Um, it also seems to have been held against Linda that she, again, similar to in Patel, she didn't avail herself of an opportunity to produce evidence or in this case, inspect it. So she tried to argue at trial that, oh, well, the CCTV isn't professional CCTV. It could have been tampered with. Um, but she had been given the opportunity to have it examined and inspected and she didn't take up that opportunity. So that was held against her. There were also communications between David and mum that day, um, and there were evidence of her phone activity. So she'd actually received a telephone call around two o'clock, an odd call, and then proceeded to make calls to Linda and David before three o'clock. So this added to the conclusion that she couldn't have been in two places at once. Um, similar to the other cases, Linda's credibility then became an issue as well. Um, but in relation to kind of unrelated documents, so to do with around the time of the dispute over theft in 2015, she started writing a diary, which the judge said was basically, he found her putting down her evidence in advance to refute any future allegations of wrongdoing, um, and that she was prepared to record a version of events which wasn't true. So he said this impacts her credibility and whether she's telling the truth now. In this case, the expert evidence was in favour of the finding of forgery, but wasn't particularly strong. It said it's fairly unlikely that the signature was mum's. This is another case where the forger didn't take the opportunity to rely on their own expert evidence. Um, she had, I think Linda had an expert, but then he didn't give a report, which in itself is a little bit suspect. But he did participate in the joint report, which said that an earlier will could have been used as the master's signature to then attempt to forge mum's signature in the later will. Um, Linda's evidence of her close relationship with the deceased was also odds, not only with David's evidence, but importantly, other witnesses independent of David. So it's useful if there's corroborating evidence from people independent of the dispute and that don't have any ax to grind. Um, and then the Binks, are particularly interesting characters because one wonders what possible reason they had to give the false evidence um, in support of the will, which was very specific. 
Um, they even signed statements saying, I've seen a photograph of this mum, Dorothy, and I can confirm that it was that lady that I saw sign the will. Um, and one comment of the judge was that Mr. Binks's evidence was so specific and certain as to identification based on a 10 minute encounter with the deceased, that that in itself placed doubt on his evidence. Um, so if you're dealing with a witness at trial um, and they're given, particularly if on the spot, they're coming up with more detailed evidence about um, the, the occasion of execution, that in itself sometimes can be an indicator um, that something's not quite right if they can be so certain of themselves after such a long period of time, and if they didn't really know the people in question. Over to you, Will. Thanks a bit. Yes, um, next, Face and Cunningham. It's another case of warring siblings. Um, in, uh, in the trial before it was under Judge, Judge Hodge QC, sitting as a deputy of the High Court. An extraordinarily dysfunctional family, as it was described. Um, none of the relatives seemed to um, have any time for each other. And although the deceased did want to benefit uh, his children, um, they barely spoke to each other. In fact, there was evidence that he, he didn't even know that his son Richard had had a child. Um, and that became important later on. Um, the alleged forger was Re Rebecca. She was taking on her sister Rowena and her brother Richard. She was listening in person. Um, it's another case, uh, uh, as with Cook and Avon, where the, the original uh, wasn't available, only only a photocopy. As the judge said, if, if Sir Arthur Conan Doyle were writing the story of this case, it would be the case of the missing original will. Um, and the interesting thing about this case is it, it wasn't one. There was um, a single joint expert, uh, handwriting expert, but, but his conclusions were inconclusive. So it was a case that had to turn on context and on, on, on credibility of witnesses. Um, so a, a lesson there that you can succeed, even if, even if the... Um, expert report doesn't doesn't produce the result that you're hoping for. Um, and the, in terms of credibility, uh, the uh, judge took a very good view of those uh, called on behalf of the uh, claimant, the um, party propounding the will. Uh, and in fact, he had to warn no less than six of them of their privilege against self-incrimination. Um, none, of, none of them avail themselves of, uh, of their right not to answer questions. Um, but that gives you a flavour of the case. So the propounder of the will, Rebecca, said there's a will from September 2017 in my favour. I don't have the original. I, I found this copy under a bedspread or, or, or sleeping bag uh, at the deceased's home. Now, my brother Richard was in the house at the time, uh, but I didn't show it to him. In fact, I deliberately concealed it from him. Um, and I left the house with it tucked under my jacket. The, the problem with that evidence as it later transpired is that everyone agreed she wasn't wearing a jacket on that occasion. Um, so there would have been nowhere for her to um, uh, hide it, or not, at least not as she said she had. The thing that really troubled the judge, you said, is that he, to find a forgery, you would have to find that the two witnesses, who apparently were strangers with no benefit under the, uh, under the uh, purported will, Mr. Humphreys and Miss McKenna, would lie. And he asked himself the question, why would they, why would they uh, involve themselves in such an outrageous lie? There wasn't an immediate explanation for that, um, but, it, but it emerged, as I'll explain. Um, the other thing that Rebecca relied upon is there was a letter that she said was from her father um, before the will in question, but which foreshadowed it, uh, a letter to her saying, I'm going to leave uh, things in a certain way to you. So there were, to find a forge, you'd have to find that that was forged as well, which he did. Um, it's uh, a homemade will, and actually what, what the forger had done in that case is actually offered quite a lot of information as to, as to why the will had been made in that way. Um, I give and bequeath my whole estate and my, and my home uh, to my daughter, unless the gifts is quite low. Remember, I don't always agree. In fact, we often, quite often we disagree. Regardless of this, you're the only one of my children to communicate with me. You're the only one to call me dad. I promised I would take care of you for the rest of your life. Uh, you've done more for me than I thought you would. I look forward to a few more years as friends. Now, there, you've got not only the, the evidence of the will is, is giving you something to look at in terms of the forensic uh, investigation as to the genuineness of the signature. You've got the date and time that, that's, that it's pinned down to, but you've also got the tone. You've got the voice. And the, and the court can re reach a conclusion as to whether that is actually Rebecca speaking, as the court indeed did, or the deceased. And that was entirely, uh, and that, if you read that, I mean, I, I, you can see how that sounds like 
a beneficiary trying to justify uh, to her siblings rather than the father speaking to her. But if you, if, if you there was more evidence of the, of the voice that he had from his journals, and this wasn't his voice. So it was held to be a forgery. It turned on credibility, as I say. Again, it's another case, as with Cook, where the burden of proof was actually treated on being on the part of propounding the will, i.e. the alleged forger. And the judge in that case said, well, that's, that's, uh, that's the case, because it's simply um, part of the due, proven due execution of the will. You have to prove that the signature is the signature of the um, deceased. Um, it's another case where there were numerous diary entries. Um, and it looked like it had been phonetic by Rebecca, so she'd removed entries for the key dates of the letter that she said she received in May before the will, and of the, the dates around the, the will itself. Um, all evidence was that actually he, the deceased was thinking of making a will, but that Richard would have been a beneficiary because he didn't want to render him homeless, Richard would occupy the house that belonged to the deceased in London. Um, the, there was also uh, a letter, a genuine letter to Rebecca, two days from her father, two days after the alleged will, uh, which was also suspicious because it didn't mention anything to do with the will that supposedly the deceased had just made and appointed her an executor, as you would expect. Um, so, analysing the evidence, the, the judge said there are four really strong evidential factors here um, that, that lead me to find this a forgery. It's surprising that the will existed at all because none of the journal entries are consistent with it having ever been made. The contents of the will itself were contrary to his known wishes. The circumstances of execution were very strange. Um, he would not have made an 80 mile round trip to Cambridge where it was said to have been executed from his home in, in Kings Lynn. And, and, and on that subject, the, the um, important aspect of the case is the witnesses who the judge had to find were lying. A reason was found. There was some sort of investigative work was done to find that there was a link between Rebecca and the two witnesses who professed not to have that link, but it turned out that Rebecca's partner had served in the armed forces in Germany at the same time as the two witnesses. Uh, so this was a conspiracy hash between those who knew each other from uh, military service. And, and that friendship obviously uh, led them to the extent of willing to lie uh, on oath before the court. Um, the claim was, in summary, was found by the judge to be totally without merit. Rebecca's case was totally without merit, and a transcript of his judgment was sent at public expense to the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, so there may be some, some follow-up on that. Um, the final case I'm going to look really quickly at is Reed Brunt. Um, it's a case of mine, it's still ongoing. Um, but I think I'm comfortable um, telling you what happened at first instance. There were effectively, um, we brought a forgery action, um, which was unsuccessful, but on appeal earlier this year, that judgment was set aside and we're going to have a retrial at the end of the year. Um, but it's a useful one to watch um, and there's a lot to it. I probably can't get through all of it, but I'll do a whistle stop tour through some of the more interesting aspects. Um, here's the case summary. Dean, the deceased, died in 2007, leaving mum, Marlene, brother Dale, sister Venetia and uncle Bob. Marlene took out letters of administration and administered on intestacy. Over 10 years later, in 2018, uncle Bob brings a claim to propound a will dated 2nd of March 1999. Marlene and Dale defend on grounds of forgery, due execution and knowledge and approval. Um, the background again is important in this case that there's a complex long running family dispute between Bob and Benicia on the one side and Marlene and Dale on the other um, and the will was just produced eight days before a mediation scheduled in part of that dispute, um, which we say improved the position of Bob and Venetia. Is my slide changing? I'm not sure that it is. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of the factors relied upon um, in the case, the will was not signed by Dean. So this is a forgery where the forger didn't even bother, we say, to attempt to replicate the signature of the deceased. He just signed, said, I signed it at his direction under Section 9 of the Wills Act. Um, the person that signed it was a convicted fraudster, Howard Day. He'd spent time in prison for fraud. Um, and he was also the person handling the family dispute for Bob and Venetia. He wasn't a solicitor, but Master Teverson found he was prepared to allow others to think that he is and had held himself out as such. He charged for his services. The witnesses were employees and associates.
rightly so this is an indicator as well because it's so rare and unusual of potential forgery. Um, there is an irregular attestation clause which the master said removed the presumption of due execution. The will also purported to give away a third share in property which the deceased didn't even own at the time of the will. He only acquired that interest several years later. So we say that was a mistake on the forger's part. Um, the name on the front of the will was incorrect and some spellings of other things were incorrect that we say Dean would have noticed if he'd seen this will. Um, and there were other peculiarities on the face of it. Um, there, was an ex there was no explanation we said or imp an implausible explanation as to why Dean would have asked Howard to sign it anyway. Um, there was similar fact evidence of Howard producing other suspicious documents. Um, we also said the circumstances in which the will came to light and the delay was suspicious. Um, in particular, the second duplicate copy of the will um, didn't come to light until shortly before the PTR. Um, Howard, who we alleged was the forger, died during the proceedings and all of his documents were handed over to instructing solicitors for Bob. And I think it was the solicitor's cat who knocked over a pile of papers off her desk um, that she prepared for shredding that she thought was just disclosure and it was only on picking them up that she felt the indentations on the will and thought this is a second original. Um, there was also evidence from the experts in our favour, including that Howard had doctored a diary entry. He'd included the words and signed up will at the end of a line, which they said were words appended in a different ink, not found anywhere else in the diary and at a different time to the rest of the entry. Notably, none of the other witnesses referred to there being two wills being signed either in their evidence. Um, aside from that, there are characteristics to Dean as well in terms of his mental health that we said made it unlikely that he would have made this will. Um, and as I say, the handwriting experts both agreed with us that there was strong evidence to support the proposition, at least in respect of the first will, that Mr Day didn't sign in 1999, but much later. And overall, it was more likely than not that both signatures were written at a later point in time. I'm trying to change slide. So as I say, the court held it wasn't a forgery. Nevertheless, the master did award costs to be paid out of the estate pursuant to the first exception to the general rule as to costs and probate claims on the basis that the way that they executed the will um, was the real cause of the litigation that this convicted fraudster did it was always going to cause dispute between the parties. Um, but as I say, um, the matter has been successfully appealed. So we're going to have a retrial in front of a high court judge um, and we have permission to reduce fresh evidence from witnesses um, relevant to the likelihood of Dean making a will. And um, also in respect of um, similar fact evidence as to Howard's modus operandi. So that's one to watch. Will, what do you think of the lessons that we've learned from all of these different forgery cases? Well, we, we'll attack this very quickly, Sophia, because our, our time is up. Um, we've suggested to you some uh, on the screen, you'll see some some of what we think of the lessons um, here. I'm going to pick out a few that I, I, I draw your attention to. I said don't underestimate, obviously, the importance of expert evidence. Don't underestimate the scope of it. Um, just because you don't have the original, it can still be quite telling, even determinative, as it was in some of the cases we've looked at. Um, the burden of proof, Sophia, seems to be up for grabs. There are increasing willingness on the part of the courts to say that the burden of proof is on the alleged forger to prove it's not a forgery. Is that fair? Um, I think that's right. Even in Brunt, um, Master Cheveston at first said, given the amount of time that it taken for the will to come to light and that Dean hadn't signed it himself, he said the burden should be on the propounder of the will to prove it's not forged. So the evidential burden shifted. So I think certainly in future forgery cases, based on all these authorities, there's scope to argue about who really does have the burden. Yeah, I think it's still up for grabs. Um, it's not an authoritative decision on that point yet. Um, but it does look at I think that's it, right. there's a forger, potentially. I, I've had it in there. It's not too late. There's a case called Ahmed and Ahmed in 2016, in which the allegation of forgery was actually pleaded by amendment on the first day of trial, um, because the evidence was pointing in that direction. There was a growing number of factors that led uh, to the suspicion that this actually wasn't a genuine will at all. Um, the issue before the court at that stage was due execution, but actually you, you've, got to, you've got to see which way the wind's blowing. Um, and if that wind is following you towards a, a, an allegation of um, forgery, um, then the court, the court may allow it, even, even, even on the first day of trial. Um, context is so important. Um, 
relationships with the, with the parties, what they told those closest to them, and their voice that you hear from, especially those that keep diaries uh, or letter writers. Um, testators who are letter writers are very helpful, or keep diaries are very helpful because you can get a sense of their true wishes uh, and whether it's likely or not that the will put forward is theirs. Um, technology other than expert evidence can be, can be important. Your case on CCTV in, in Patel, for example, Sophia. Yes, I think that's right. Um, and also, I think that this kind of falls in with a couple of the different bullet points. I think when you're assessing the merits of a forgery claim, you need to look at the totality of the evidence, which will and be creative. So you need to think about, well, not just looking at the will or asking experts to examine the will, but what other documents, either those produced by the forger, um, can you be creative like they were in Patel, following people potentially to see whether people are meeting up to coach each other? Is there CCTV? Um, I think all of these things you need to just look in the round and not just focus on one particular piece of evidence but think how does the totality of the evidence stack up because lots of these cases the evidence was cumulative in effect wasn't it yes exactly I mean that all of these are building blocks and one of the ones we haven't mentioned is the circumstances in which they find the will a forger often goes directly to where they find it and say there it is without asking the usual questions such as I think there's a will and asking asking people whether they've seen it it just suddenly appears, usually with a lot of exclamation marks after the uh, discovery. <laughs> found the um, will, the more well, the exclamation marks, just before, the more it sounds. Yeah, and or conveniently just before um, something's about to happen in an unrelated dispute, which is why the context, like you said, is so important um, to this will being produced. Um, the only other thing I think I'd highlight um, is about not overlooking motive. I think that's so important. The appeal judge said in Brunt, look, this is essentially a fraud trial. You need to bear that in mind and address the case and approach it just like you would um, that kind of that kind of cause of action. Yeah, we, we assume always that the motive is money, but there was more to it. In, in Face and Cunningham, uh, there was a lady who resented her father, who um, felt that in the divorce she'd be left with her mother, who she said had abused her. And she had a, a, a grudge against her father and against her siblings. Um, and that was held to be part of the motive, uh, not just money. Anyway, um, we've run out. Thank you very much for joining us.